scripts, correct? Correct. Okay, and April, are you ready? They're ready, so go ahead, Mary. Okay, the Board of Certified Advanced Estheticians uh, Esthetician meeting is convening at 9.03 a.m. on October 28th. I will call the roll. Rebecca Covey. Yes. Uh, Janet Paquette. Here. Mark Davis. Here. Christy Knapp. Yes. Mary Nielsen is here. Gordon Trone is not here. Members, during the course of the meeting, please wait to speak until recognized by the chair. Once you've been recognized, please state your last name. Audience members are asked to sign in on the attendance roster. Public interested party feedback may be here during the public interested party feedback period if indicated on the agenda. Everyone is asked to use appropriate language, manners, and protocols when conducting board business. This meeting is called to order. Okay. And so I have the first uh, item for action is approval of the agenda. So has everyone had an opportunity to review the agenda and could I have a motion to approve the agenda? This is Christy Knapp. Um, and I motion to approve the agenda. Does someone wish to second that motion? This is Rebecca Heavy. I move to second that motion. Okay. A motion's been made to approve the agenda. I will call the roll. Um, Rebecca Covey. Here. It, yay or nay? <laughs> yay or nay? Um, yay, sorry. Yay. Janet Pickett. Yay. Mark Davis. Yes. Christy Knapp. Yay. Mary Nielsen, yes. Okay. Next on the agenda is approval of the 2021 chairperson. So this is Sylvie. So you guys have a part of your materials um, and hopefully you all have remembered um, way back in February, um, prior to COVID, uh, we kind of put on hold the election of the chair, due to, um, chair and vice chair um, due to the ethics issue going on with Mary. <clears throat> However, that is all complete. All those documents are in, in here and hopefully you've read them. Um, I'm assuming Mary would like to say something about all this, and then we can have a discussion from there. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. Thank you, Sylvie. First off, I wish to publicly declare for the record, I own an advanced aesthetic school licensed by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission as a private career school. Although no one is required to attend my school, I may have the opportunity to financially benefit from a person who enrolls in my school. I also wish to state for the record that I have written a textbook that was independently selected by the American Board of Laser Surgery, the organization that administers the Oregon State Board exam for advanced estheticians to become licensed certified advanced estheticians as a recommended resource for study for the exam. Three additional resources for the exam were also independently selected by the American Board of Laser Surgery for the exam. If someone opts to use the book that I have written as a resource for the exam, uh, I have the opportunity to financially benefit. I received a 1099 for $675.64 for royalties on the sales of this book in 2019. I did go to a meeting of the uh, ethics committee and I would like to, sorry, while I go through some of my papers and find my paperwork. Okay. So, <clears throat> I believe there are some errors in the government ethics commission's report. 
For example, on page one, Deborah Maston is identified as a former member of the Oregon Board of Advanced Estheticians. Deborah Maston has never been a member of the Oregon Board of Advanced Estheticians. On page two, the Educational Advisory Committee identified in the report was a work group committee organized by the Health Licensing Office. It was composed of some members of the Board of Advanced Estheticians as well as other aesthetic educators, business owners, and practitioners. Um, a side note, when I received the, the letter about this ethics uh, complaint against me, um, the minutes, the agenda and the minutes of that meeting from April 12th of 2017 were not posted to the public on the HLO's website. I made a public records request on January 24th of 2020. I received a response back on February 3rd, 2020 that the information that I requested was not available to me through public records and I was instructed to contact HLO directly. HLO did send me a USB so that I could, because I had no recollection of this work group meeting. Uh, they sent me a USB on February 1st of 2020. Unfortunately, that was too late for me to meet the deadline of Lisa Kristen's report so that I could refresh my memory on a meeting that took place, um, let's see, how many months ago? 35, 36 months ago. Um, on page four, the ABLS report from Steve Fisher in, is in error. The source material was never approved by the working exam committee or the Board of Certified Advanced Estheticians in 2018. Um, commission staff have validated that fact by reviewing every agenda and minutes of meetings in 2018. The Ethics Commission was never able to verify at which meeting the decision was made to adopt the book. The book has never been brought to the board as an agenda item. On April 13th of 2017, one day after the work group meeting on April 12th of 2017, I sent Theresia Murphy an email with attachments for seven different sources of curriculum. Hi, Cerithia, here are photos of additional educational resources I have. Let me know if you need any extra info. I've also included a journal article from the Aesthetic Surgery Journal that's an excellent laser resource theory. I hope you're heading into a great weekend, Mary. One of the attachments was the book I had written. I did not promote my book or encourage its adoption in my emails to Cerithia. In another email to Cerithia dated July 11th of 2017, I said my book is out on Amazon and I have copies I could bring to the meeting if it would be helpful. She said that's awesome. Oh, reply from Cerithia, same day. It's awesome you are selling on Amazon. I'm happy for you. The HLO will not be listing resources with the curriculum. The sourcing material will be requested by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission on the school application. Another email from Cerithia on July 11th of 2017. Hello, Mary, even though we're not listing resources, is there any way you could bring one book for me to have as a reference along with the other references that I have so far? Thank you, Cerithia. On page nine and 10 of the Ethics Commission's report, I did not approach a publishing company indicating that the Board of uh, Certified Advanced Estheticians needed a textbook. My first contact with the publishing company began in October of 2016, six months prior to our meeting in April of 2017. Prior to licensure as a private career school, I had operated my business as a training center for advanced aesthetics. I had approached several publishing companies in 2016 about publishing a book to consolidate the material that I had created to use for students at my training center into one edition. In addition to being a school owner, an advanced esthetician, I consider myself an author. I have six published books on aesthetics. I hold contracts with a number of different aesthetic journals to provide material to them on a regular basis. I provide content in contracts to Dermascope, to Skin Inc. magazine. I have written four chapters in the current Milady's Aesthetic Standard textbook. I contacted 
the Oregon Ethics Commission on December 13th of 2017 to request their help to craft a statement to be read at board meetings in order to publicly declare any conflict of interest and avoid the appearance of doing anything wrong when the agenda intent was education and curriculum. I trusted the Ethics Commission the Ethics Commission's expertise to draft an appropriate statement to protect my position of service on the Board of Advanced Esthetician. I have read this statement at numerous board meetings where curriculum or any other agenda items that pertain to education have been discussed. The Oregon Estheticians for Fair Licensure, which is an Oregon group on social media, began posting and reposting untruths about myself and the school I own in the late fall of 2019. When myself or any of, the, or of my staff attempted to post corrections to these pieces of misinformation, we were blocked from the group. These defaming comments affected my business. For example, a post Please read this entire post, calling all the Oregon estheticians and estheticians nationwide. The Board of Cosmetology in Oregon has passed a law that will go into effect January 1 of 2020 that will inhibit estheticians that do not hold an advanced license in using gentle and non-invasive modalities, including high-frequency, galvanic, LAT, microcurrent, dermaplaning, hydrofacial microdermabrasion, and much more. Estheticians in Oregon have paid thousands of dollars for their education to be stripped of anything other than basic facials. The kicker, the owner of a popular advanced aesthetic school in Oregon has been added to the Board of Cosmetology and convinced the board of these changes and will directly benefit from this law. If this law doesn't get reversed, estheticians will be forced to pay $16,000 tuition at her school because it has a monopoly on the market. This is an oversight in our legal system. This is fraud. This is corruption at the core. Your favorite treatment will be illegal for your esthetician to perform, and estheticians all over Oregon will be put out of business. And this goes on and on and on. I began to receive angry phone calls. My business began to receive angry phone calls. I began to receive hate mail. This was affecting the, my quality of life. I was forced to send a cease and desist letter to this group on December 22nd of 2019. Deborah Maston is a leader in this group. I don't believe it's a coincidence that she filed this complaint four days after receiving the cease and desist letter from my attorney. I believe I am a person of high integrity. I would have a personal philosophy of doing the right thing and giving back. My intention of serving on this board of certified advanced estheticians was in service and not in personal gain. The industry and those that practice in it truly have my utmost respect, sincerity, and authenticity at all times. I have never attempted to limit people's practice of aesthetics. My intent has been to keep the public safe and keep estheticians educated. And I look forward, I feel like this has dominated our 2020 agenda and we have been unable to move forward with the things that are important for advanced estheticians, such as finding other pathways to licensure. I look forward to moving into 2021 with that same philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Does anyone have any, no, I was does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, this is Davis, Mark. Yes. Uh, so my question is, can we last, at the last meeting we were all together, um, the question was asked, was Mary's book peer-reviewed? Peer and um, she says, yeah, absolutely it was. And so I'd like her to um, explain that, please, if you don't mind. Certainly. Um, so my book, well, first of all, I believe my book ended up being peer reviewed by just being sent to ABLS. I know that ABLS 
uh, is an organization that is reputable, and they reviewed the book along with whatever other um, educational resources. Additionally, I did pay for a paid review with the risk that, that it would not be, um, it, I wouldn't get a positive review. It was just sort of like a 50-50, okay, maybe they'll like it, maybe they won't. And so I think that review was through a, a company called Clarion, and they do, I guess, well, I, I guess at the time, I believe they were going to be doing more of a professional review. Not just, like, it wouldn't just be like my sister sitting down and reading the book, but someone who is knowledgeable about skin care sitting down to read the book and give a professional review about it. So the, so that's those are my so, two. I'm sorry. Is, is, so the, because what, what we saw was, um, and it shows in the information, is the person who um, reviewed it was just someone on Amazon that was, I mean, anyone could just pay someone on, on Amazon to say, yeah, this is a good book or whatever, but that's that's not a peer review. That's our that's not a peer of ours. That's somebody. Oh yeah, I'm not I'm not counting about I'm not counting on Amazon reviews. I know that those are uh, professional. But that's, reviews. The one, that's the one that was listed and touted last time as the peer review. I'm sorry. I guess Mark, I would have to go back and and uh, look at the minutes because I don't. I don't recall seeing the, the Amazon review was a peer review. That, that was my, yeah, we need to revisit that. So I guess my problem is that to hear all this disparaging the report, um, disputing the ethics commission, I'm not sure if that's a winning, I'm not sure if that's a winning message because I mean, you're the one who quickly went to walk, uh, squash an investigation by paying a fine. So why would you pay a fine? Quick, quickly pay a fine just right away rather than allow an investigation to take place. I don't understand that. Why did, oh, well, because in speaking, okay, why didn't I understand that? Because the bottom line is I did make those statements in a meeting. I made those statements, but those statements were not made with the intent that I was going to have financial gain. And I think that's the point. The point is I can't dispute what is the, um, the, the minutes from that meeting. So that's why I was fined $250. That is the minimum fine that they, that they have. And so I just believe that in, in the essence of time, I don't want this to drag on and influence this group. I can say yes. Uh, apparently, I made those statements 33, 35 months ago. I also believe that if this was such a critical thing, why are we now dealing with it three and a half years later? Why wasn't it brought up The reason why we're now dealing with it, um, pardon me, uh, this is Mark Davis. The reason we're dealing with it now is because we're considering appointing you as our leader. That's why. You know, there would have been a more thorough and complete investigation had you not paid the fine and agreed to settle. So you squashed the investigation and now you're attacking the Ethics Commission. Mm, I see it differently. This is Rebecca. So, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, oh, yes, Rebecca. I, oh, oh, can I make one comment before Rebecca? Yes. That, the investigation, you have all of the emails. The emails between, you have all of our emails. I don't know what else there would be to investigate. There's, you have any email conversations? I, I don't even know what Steve Fisher at ABLS looks like. I the could, emails are, not, are very complimentary. <laughs> the emails don't paint a rosy picture, Mary. I'm sorry. Well, you know, I mean, this is what it is. Okay, sorry, Rebecca, please take the floor. A comment off of what I've seen. So, based off of what I said, Mary presented her book, and ABLS thought it was a really good fit compared to what else was out there. 
and it was agreed that he would need to make a statement that he had a conflict of interest at any meeting where there would be a vote. And he didn't state the conflict in a meeting where there was no vote, and now I feel like we're just honestly wasting everyone's time. And I feel like we need to get, the board needs to get back on the purpose of what it was formed for, which was the power exercises in Oregon, and to keep the public safe. And that's all of which I've seen Mary Nielsen spend her entire career working towards. Thank you. Go ahead, Jan. Um, I, I have more to say, but I just want to point out, since Rebecca and Mary have both brought up the declaration that she makes, even the declaration she made today states that her text was independently selected. And because we didn't get a full investigation of the concerns, we don't know that that's true. We do know that Mary herself says admits to guilt in this, and yet she continues to this day to present herself as not having been a part of it. And I think that's disingenuous and it's concerning. This is Suzanne. This is Rebecca Go ahead. May I speak? I'm sorry, Rebecca. Go ahead. Um, no, I just recall, I don't know if we're talking about something different, but I recall being at a meeting, and maybe that's what we need to bring up for the minutes, where we actually all voted on this with ABLS, um, if we're going to use this um, information. And so I'm just confused a little bit. Maybe, I, maybe I'm, um, you know, thinking back to something incorrectly, but um, I just remember all the voting on that. Can I respond by cutting in? Yeah. So that's kind of my point. The words independently selected by ABLS indicates that it was independently selected, but because there was no investigation and because of the behavior she admitted guilt to, we don't know that she didn't send emails to ABLS to promote her book. We don't know if she has some. She's been in this business a long time. Perhaps she has a, a special relationship or a friendly relationship with a party who helped, quote, independently select it. We don't know any of that. And I feel like without the investigation, I still have concerns. Also, I have voiced concerns on day one about conflict of interest and Mary. And yet, on, at multiple meetings. So it's not like this has never been brought up before. Nielsen. I would like to speak. Janet, actually, I have listened to all of the meetings. I have listened to every, of course, being involved in this investigation. I have listened to every meeting. There was no meeting where this book was ever brought to the board to vote on. What was brought to the board was to use ADLS as, a, as the testing option. At that time, we really didn't have any other options. We were under the wire with time in order to move forward and meet the state obligation for when we had to have this licensure active. And I understand that you believe that you uh, have voiced your concerns. However, if you go back to our initial meeting, you were the person that nominated me for the vice chair position. I'm sorry, Mary. Yeah, I get it again. That doesn't have anything to do with this, and I would like to point out that I am not contesting that ABLS be the body to, that we agree that ABLS would be the body to whom we would refer. My concern now that all of this is known is the quote about it being independently selected. And we have no way of discussing that since we have no investigation. That's all I'm pointing out. This is Rebecca Kevy. I'd like to make a comment. Um, it sounds like to me, like, this is more of something bigger. We have Suzanne Warfield that's on this um, meeting, and I recall back to when we formed this board and she was not in support of it because we were not adopting her materials um, in the beginning, talking about adopting her materials because they weren't thorough enough. Um, because we did, we did look into all of these different options. There was even another um, option we looked into, but we couldn't quite find what we needed. Um, Cerencia was also involved in this, and I remember 
us all going through this at board meetings. And so I feel like there's a little bit bigger of a picture here because, Dan, I mean, um, I don't know what your working relationship is with Deborah Mastin, who's also, um, you know, been involved with not with wanting to ban um, NCEA being what we adopted as materials. And I know, I think you worked with her or worked for her, I don't know. But is there potentially another conflict of interest going on here? Um, I don't have a working relationship with Deborah Mastin. I have, uh, for instance, the very long discussion that Mary read into the minutes just now about that group that she feels defamed her. I have no relationship with that group. I've read none of their emails. I have had, I've never had a discussion with Deborah discussing board business. I, I don't believe I have a conflict that I haven't mentioned since the very first day, and that is that a person who was effective in bringing this bill forward and shaping how the law would look, who at that time had, if not the only, close to the only available school that would benefit from it, then sat as chair on the board these are all areas that I have repeatedly brought up as conflict. I, I have nothing against Mary personally, or even I believe that she probably has dedicated her life to teaching and to trying to ensure the safety of the public. But in her role as an educator and ensuring the safety of the public, she is not exempt from experiencing conflict. As, as her, in her position as chair, she brought forward her book. She knew she had done that, and yet she has never, until the investigation got started, said, hey, that was a conflict of interest. I'm going to make money from this book. Uh, I need to address this somehow. Uh, whether she so you know, Nelson, you know, I am I'm not the chair. You are referring to me as the chair, and I'm not. Okay. You're the acting chair, and you're, we are discussing now whether to vote for you as chair. Whether you make yeah, hundred dollars or six thousand dollars, it's a conflict. It doesn't matter yeah, how much you make. This is Rebecca Tubby. Did you just say that you have no working relationship at all with Deborah Mastin? I do have no working relationship with Deborah Mastin. When the first aesthetics issues came up and we had a chance to try to grandfather as many people who were already practicing safely in, I helped oversee and taught several of her MD classes at no remuneration. I took no money. I saw this as a, an issue for women in this field and a handful of men, to you, Mark, who were about to lose their livelihood, and I felt an obligation to step in and try to help. That's all I did. I did not take money. I don't work for Deborah. I never have worked for Deborah. And I taught a handful of classes on the more advanced issues that Deborah didn't feel qualified to teach. That's it. And I don't have any relationship with her now in that fashion, ever since it went to 2018 when we could no longer grandfather people in. Um, this is David. Um, can, may I ask you please? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Uh, no, David. No. This is David. This is Mark Davis. Um, oh, sorry. I'm hearing David Howe. Sorry. So um, the, uh, the last meeting we were at all together in person, it was the, there was a word that, that stood out to me which has bothered me, and I want to bring it up. It was said there was a vendetta. There was a vendetta against Mary, and I resent that because we're trying to do the business here. But we decided that we're going to put that aside. We're going to um, hold on and look at an investigation that was forthcoming, and that's why we're here now, because we were waiting for the investigation and the results of the, the investigation. Yeah. And so, no, I'm, I'm going to continue. Uh, you were right. I didn't realize you were finished talking. So Continue. I'm sorry. The word... The word Vendetta were mentioned several times, and so um, then for those of us who are just wait, we just we want to wait and see what the investigation has to say, and then a fine was 
People don't pay fines because they're completely 100% innocent. And so the investigation was stopped, a fine was paid. And in my mind, people actually need to apologize for using the word vendetta. I don't think vendetta is something that should have been ever said. And now it's being turned around like, well, uh, Janet Paquette needs to explain something. But we're talking about, are we going to elect Mary the chair? And and so, you know, listening to the um, listening to Mary's conversation, or I mean, <laughs> listening to Mary talking about all these different things concerning that investigation, there was. To me, it was like slamming Deborah Mastin. Um, and I'm not sure if that's appropriate. And to say people are having a vendetta, I mean, it looks like there was no vendetta, and it looks like there was true, honest ethics problems. And so let's not call it a vendetta, and let's not try and turn it around, because there's only one person who's been charged with some ethics problems here. And we're going to turn it around and make Janet, Dr. Jan explain herself, you know, and that's our, you know, <laughs> to me that seems sort of crazy. I'm not sure why we're doing that. Rebecca, so. this is Rebecca, and I feel like the only reason why Mary had to um, do that is because she didn't state the conflict at a meeting where there was no vote. That's I think why that happened. And I honestly, I've been around since this board was formed, and I know all the backstory of when this all started and what this is really all about. So I do feel like this is a witch hunt personally. So David How here. I, David How here. Um, I just wanted to talk. I mean, I'm a non-voting member here, and you're dealing with issues and trying to wade your way through them. So as an advisory member, I just wanted to throw out a couple of things. A process has taken place. It's now somewhat dated, around three years plus, it sounds like. I was involved as an advisory member through all of that time frame also. So a complaint was made regarding ethics. It went into the Oregon Government Ethics. Commission. They did their preliminary review, which the document is in front of everyone. So they went through a process. Um, folks are talking about whether an invest complete investigation occurred. Well, what you have is in front of you. And that does constitute a level of investigation. And at the conclusion of that investigation, or part of it, it entered into a stipulated final order. Um, it's Mary's right, okay, to enter into a stipulated final order. Um, I think we need to be careful about the types of words that are being used here, uh, squash, vendetta, what have you. Um, they're emotionally charged words um, as opposed to trying to look at this objectively. Um, so the fact that Mary has a stipulated final order, the Oregon Ethics Commission uh, makes the decision about whether they want to entertain that or whether they think that's appropriate or not. So if members of this board don't feel it is complete or not satisfactory to your standard, really the issue is more with the Ethics Commission than someone who had a, you know, an allegation of ethics against them. Um, the idea of, of making a statement after the fact basically says that, you know, Mary isn't um, contesting. I, I, that may not be the right word, but if you were to take a look through that stipulated agreement, it basically says the commission releases settles and compromise, or com compromises any and all claims which have been or could be asserted against Mary within the scope of the above reference proceedings. It sounds like this is a rehash of something that has already been processed and completed. So if you're using this conversation and your concerns, 
and I'm not weighing in whether they're right or wrong um, or take a side. Um, if you're using this as a basis to decide whether to have Mary be your chairperson, uh, fine, so be it. Um, you'll take your vote. You'll either approve her to be chairperson or you won't. Uh, but, you know, really this matter has been formally dealt with. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you, David. David. Yeah, this is Mark. May I speak, please? Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. And maybe there we need to dial back. You know, I mentioned vendetta. That wasn't my word. And squash, I agree. Um, you know, I want to be fair here. But um, I, what I heard in the opening statement is a whole lot of drama and a whole lot of the commission was wrong, the ethics commission was did wrong, and Mary, Deborah Mathen is wrong. Is this the leadership that we're going to move forward and say, yeah, let's rubber stamp that? Um, Christy Knapp, I'd like to speak. Yes, please, Christy. I agree that this has dominated our agenda in 2020. I've been at every single meeting since I became a member of this board. But what I'm hearing, because I don't really know the people in any of these parties, I feel like I'm just sitting here taking it all in. And I do feel that Mary was only stating mistakes on the – she saw mistakes in writing and just wanted to correct it. And I also feel that like, um, when Janet was speaking, she just also was trying to clarify some things that she felt were incorrect. I, I agree with how when, I mean, I think where the vendetta and where those comments came in, those are just emotional comments because the things going on on Facebook or, or the relationships people have are real things. So it's just emotions responding to emotions and I think we're all human so we can all understand. Like, it's Yes, maybe we use words we shouldn't, but I think we all understand where it's coming from and we all have our opinions and our feelings about it. But I think at the end of the day, I have to go back to what House said is this is, we all agree there's gray areas. I think the truth of the matter is many people have asked the question if it's a conflict of interest. With Mary, and I have to be completely honest, I've thought those thoughts myself way back in the beginning. And as I've done my homework, I believe that the intent was always pure. I do think when money's involved, that's why things have escalated. And I feel our industry is struggling for so many reasons right now. I mean, COVID and, and business being down is just, you know, those are at the top of the list. But the division between advanced aesthetics and basic aesthetics has never been bigger. And I also feel that we as leaders in this industry, we are disputing gray areas that are already done. We all are fairly informed, give or take. And I do feel that we all probably have enough information to make a decision. And I feel like we need to be working together, whether it's our schools working together or our estheticians and advanced estheticians working together because I feel like we could beat this dead horse for a long time on he said, she said. I think there were maybe some mistakes on all sides. And I think our intent is truly to just bring it to the light and move on. Thank you, Christy. Thanks. Thank you, Christy. This is David. Um, and those are, I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not very happy with the opening statement. Uh, discouraging the ethics commission, trashing Deborah Mathen. I, I don't think that's leadership quality. I don't think that's leadership. Uh, you know, you, you're right, Christy. The, the problems we have are enormous. And I said last time, maybe we need to look in a new direction for leadership. You know, some people would say, some people may make the case like somebody who's ethically challenged on a board, we, let's vote to remove them. 
and we're, we're, we're talking about like, well, let's elevate that person to leadership. Just food for thought. Can I say one more thing? I guess because I am, like, I don't know the whole backstory for this entire situation, but does Mary speak Spanish too? I'm not even sure, like, I don't know that she, I don't know if she does or doesn't. I'm just asking that question. I'm sorry, Christy, you cut out for a moment. Could you repeat that? Oh, I, my question is, yes, do, can you hear me clearly now? Yes. Okay. My question is because I'm not sure where we fit with this entire situation. My question is, does Mary want to be the chairman's bill? Is that what we're questioning? Thank you. May I speak? Good. I'm going to speak. This is Nielsen. Personally, I don't believe that it would be in the best interest for me to move into a chairperson position. However, if I had my druthers, I would prefer to stay as vice chairperson through 2021. After that, my term is up, and so I believe that I could serve in a vice chair position through 2021. I believe that I would nominate Christy Knapp to be a, the chairperson of this committee because she has attended every meeting and has stayed informed on the issues that affect both advanced estheticians and standard estheticians. She is a business owner as well as a practitioner, and I believe that she would have, I believe she has vision and insight uh, to move this committee into action that will benefit aesthetics in Oregon. This is David. Uh, this is. I'm sorry. This is Rebecca. Go, no, go ahead, Rebecca, please. Uh, um, I was just wondering. So, are so Mary? Were you making a motion, or were you just commenting? I was just commenting. I believe I cannot. Can, uh, Sylvie, can I make a motion? Uh, no this discussion and. This is Pardon? this is Sylvie, and no, you cannot make a motion because you are the acting chair. So somebody else would have to. So you were so, expressing your okay, so that's what thoughts. I believe. Mar Mary, so, this is yeah. Rebecca Covey. So, so I would like to make a motion and move that we do um, nominate Christy Knapp as chairperson because I do feel like um, she's a very neutral and balanced voice, voice within the board. And I think she'd make an actual excellent fit for chairperson. And so if that's something she would be willing to take on, of course, I think um, just listening to her and her forward-moving um, conversation, we, there's a lot of work we need to get done in the board that we talked about doing, um, you know, such as with all the schools and trying to really do the right thing. And, and I don't... Um, the contention that I felt on these last few meetings, I think that all needs to go away. I think we need to move along. I appreciate um, David's comment, very intelligent. Uh, I think he's been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, some of us are newer at this. And I think it's time for us to work hard as a board to um, really come together and, you know, like, like Christy said, we're all dealing with a lot here in 2020. And it's been really tough in business. We're dealing with COVID-19. Uh, we're dealing with, um, you know, different issues to do with estheticians and uh, certified advanced estheticians. Um, and then we're going back to a lot of things that had happened years and years ago. And I believe we should move forward, make the right decisions, work on some of the things we talked about working on um, to kind of rectify maybe some of these these. Uh, issues and um, and do what we were supposed to do by forming this board and that is basically make it a safe um, a safe place for consumers to, to come to um, you know and and move along so I'd like to actually move to um, nominate Christine Knapp as chair for uh, this is David I'd like to respond please may I respond? Um, I think I Nielsen, I believe I have to go through the motion first. Is this correct, Sylvie? Oh, and then, yeah, yeah. 
Well, okay. This, hold on, hold on. Chris, you might want to hear from Christy first because if she, she doesn't feel comfortable doing that, you might not want to try and move forward with that. Okay. Christy, how do you feel yeah. about this? Um, this is Christy now. I mean, I, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised, but I, I'm willing to do whatever. I joined this board because I feel like this needs to be a voice between. Um, the health licensing office and and the people out in the trenches. So I, I just want to be a person that helps move everything forward. So I'm I'm happy to do it. I assume um, I'm scrambling through my emails here to see what the responsibilities are, but I'm at the <laughs> meetings anyway. I think I have to be truly honest. My number one goal would besides helping our advanced aesthetics and our basic estheticians navigate is to really find some unity. I feel like there's so much talent on these schools, and I know there's some in Portland as well. And I feel like, and I'm not trying to side with Mary here, but I feel like Mary picked up a ball first, but it hasn't been tossed around to every single person as well as it could have. And I, for that reason, I would be willing, but I also want, I respect the wisdom in the, in the room. And so I, um, I mean, I, I think it would be nice to hear feedback from others. I don't, I don't need it. I, I would be willing, this is a cause that's near and dear to my heart, so I'm willing to do it, but I also want, would want to navigate responsibly. So I guess that would be my answer. So, Davis, may I speak? Yes, Mark. Mary, just just a real quick, Mary. Um, we can, everybody can express their opinions before we get a second. So you're everybody's fine giving their Got opinions. It. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Mark. I um, I respect Christy. I respect all of you, uh, and I have always viewed through this process, which has been minimal and Rebecca is correct. We some of us haven't been here very long. We're trying to do the best we can. We're trying to do what's right for our community. And we have our thoughts and we have our emotions and we and um, you know we're trying to do what's right. And uh, Christy is somebody who I respect very much and feel that um, she has been a neutral voice through all of it. She was the one who recommended that we postpone the last vote uh, when we were all together so that we could wait for the investigation. And um, she's also somebody who, um, you know, is, uh, you know, neutral to, in my opinion. Um, we, we all have relationships, or I do, and so does Mary with Christy. Um, and in, a, in, a, in an effort to bring us all together, um, I, I wouldn't oppose that because um, I think that clearly we are completely impotent if we're just waiting for, uh, you know, trying to get to the next meeting in order to get leadership. And we've got enormous problems to deal with, clearly. And um, so my tendency would be to say yes for that. Uh, and I appreciate the, the thought of, um, of moving forward in that direction. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jan, uh, do you have any comments that you want to make before they, we move forward with all uh, this? Go ahead. Well, I, I agree with Rebecca here. I think um, Chrissy's been wonderful on the board, and I, I hope all of us try to be neutral and yet still be able to speak. Um, I am uh, completely in support of her being chair. I have the same concerns about the vice chair position as I do about the chair position with Mary just because of these issues aren't going to be gone. 
and because of the way the people we represent have expressed themselves. I, I do think that uh, Mary has wonderful advice to give and a lot of experience, and I bet Christy would like to have that. Um, so I, I just have a little angst about um, if this automatically goes forward with Christy as chair when we vote and ongoing with Mary as vice chair. I don't know if we need to address that separately. I don't know how that works with rules and or if it's even needed. So, so Christy's opinion is probably good on that. <laughs> I believe that the vice chair has to be a second decision. Is that correct, Sylvie? Yes, you do have to vote on both chair and vice chair today. So we'll get to the discussion of vice chair. So we're, let's stay on the focus of chair at the moment. Okay. okay. Is there anybody so we have had a motion? Oh. Go ahead, Mary. Sorry. Well, we have, I believe everyone has voiced their opinion. We have had a motion from Rebecca to uh, nominate Christy Knapp as chairperson. Is there anyone who would like to second the motion? I'll second the motion, Mark Davis. Okay, and I will call the roll. Mary Nielsen, yes. Janet Paquette? Yes. Rebecca Covey? Yes. Mark Davis? Aye. Christy Knapp? Yay. Okay, that motion has carried. Uh, are we ready to move on to this? Congratulations, Christy. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I think that's going to be awesome. Okay, we have the next agenda item, which is approving the vice chair person. This is Rebecca. Okay. I, I, can I, sorry. I, I move to keep Mary as vice chair. She's been very, very helpful in this board as far as uh, everything that she's helped to do um, over the years. And I, I feel like Christy could really benefit from from that. And as David was saying, I feel like all of these other issues have been taken care of. Um, and I think as a vice chair position, it would be valuable to keep her. So I move Mary in that position. Can we have some discussion? Um, <laughs> is there any discussion? I can't. This is Christy um, now. Uh, oh yeah, and I was just going to say I would. I really would like everybody to weigh in on this. I think it's really important. So Pequette, um I already weighed in on it. I don't know if I have to do it again for the minute. So I have the same concerns. Uh, about conflict. I, nonetheless, I do think Christie's opinion, uh, in my, for me, Christie's opinion outweighs my concerns. If she honestly believes that she is would move forward best with Mary as her vice chair, and if she feels that the greater body that we represent of advanced estheticians and and secondarily in their relationships with estheticians. If she thinks also that that general body, because she knows it much better than I do, um, would feel the same, but then I don't have any other concerns. This is Davis. So uh, the only concern I have, um, and, this is, and this has been an emotional and dramatic meeting, and um, the last meeting that we were all together was very difficult and on all sides, and I hate to say sides, but it, it is sides. Um, and I know uh, that Christy and Mary have a relationship. I have a relationship with Mary and Christy. We're humans, we're, we're people. Um, Mary was very distraught at the last, at the last meeting we were physically together and you know, Mary was crying on Christy's shoulder. I, I, what I would want to know is, um, you know, 
And but on the other side, Mary has a lot to a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. I think we need to tackle huge problems. And so uh, my concern is to Christy, um, the same as what uh, what Dr. Jan just said is Christy, how would you feel? I mean, you 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 would have to be completely a leader. You would have to be independent of of Mary um, feeling like she's being thrown under the bus and and everyone's against her and there's a vendetta and there's Deborah Mass is against her and you would have to weigh that against because you two will be basically representing all of us to the health licensing office. So, um, you know, are you emotionally swayed by Mary, you know, feeling like she's been the target of a vendetta and she's been treated badly and, uh, you know, things didn't work out right for her? That, that yeah, would be my um, question. This is Christina. Yeah. You know, Mark, I appreciate your honesty because, so I have not spoken with Mary outside of board business for probably several years, but I did, um, I know that she was emotional at the last meeting and I think your words were perfectly selected when you said it, it felt like size because I felt that also. I will tell you that my ability to be neutral is unwavering. I have mixed feelings because my biggest fear with Mary, I think Mary would be great advice. I also don't know how Mary feels emotionally about, like, what are the benefits, what are the positives and negatives of her being the vice. I think those are, those are good questions to ponder as well. On the positive side, I would say Mary being vice it would be very helpful. We all know she has a wealth of information. But on the negative side, I have to be super honest, if we, we need our team, like we need Janet, we need, we need unity. So that would be my only, my question isn't whether she would be a great vice, my question is can the team, can I call it a team because that's what the word that I use in my company. Um, but can our board members, can we all have unity with her as the vice? I know that my ability to speak very frankly to Mary or anyone else will never change. And I think bringing all the information, like you asking this question, I think it's, we need to get it all out right now so that we can move forward very positively and I'm still neutral I, I think Mary would be a good vice. I don't know if part of this, and I know this is official business, but we're dealing with people and feelings here. I know Mary's invested a lot of time, so I think she would be good in that regard, but I want, I want unity. So I, I just think we need to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I would definitely not be opposed to Mary being the vice. I think it would be great, but but I think we just really need to dive in as to whether we can have unity with that. So, David Howe here. If I could add on to Chrissy, your, your, your comments, kind of frame it. <clears throat> now, as individual board members, you're looking at choosing leadership. And that vice chair is obviously an important piece of that. Um, it's, it's, again, you know, moving forward as people have referenced. I think when you, you know, weigh your thoughts about, you know, how it, how it strikes you, whether it be a good decision for, you know, you to select a, a certain person, when you vote, it can't really be, in my mind, a conditional vote, a qualified vote. You're voting because you believe this person is the right person for the job. Um, and as a board, that goes to being, quote, unified, I think your leaders need to know that you support them if you're choosing them as a leader. Not that there are you know, conditions, um, qualifications to it, that vote. Uh, if, you, if you can't see yourself making it and being fully supportive of, of the decision of the group, um, 
then you maybe need to take a different kind of vote. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, David. And this is Christine Knapp. I would like to say one more thing. Um, thank you for giving giving us that food for thought because I have to say I feel that Mary would probably dedicate the most amount of time to the board and I can count on her being there. So for that reason, I would pro I would I think Mary would make a a great vice chair. Is there any other discussion that people would like to have? Ken? Am I able to speak? Yes. Um, so if we were in the room together, I'd be able to see Christy. And <laughs> this is a little weird because we're having to conduct it like this one person at a time and we can't read each other's body language and so on. But. I don't have Facebook. I've never had Facebook. I don't have any idea about all of that stuff that Mary read. I haven't heard any of that. Um, and Christy, I don't know if you do. I don't know if you're aware of uh, kind of, and maybe the, whatever that group is that she was talking about is so one-sided you can't get a feeling for of uh, what the general body of advanced petitions are asking of us, but I do think that that is also something important to at least consider. Uh, uh, my most important qualification for me is um, that we can get moving forward and get off the subject. I don't like being, a, quote, the other side. I've never tried to be that person. I do feel like when we sit on the board, we each should speak our mind. That's why we're there. So we shouldn't be villainized for it. And I feel a little bit like maybe that's happened and I, I don't want to be in that position. That's just my own personal issue with, with what's happening now. Um, but in terms of supporting Chrissy, I, I'm fully confident she'd be a great chairperson. I just don't know, Chrissy, if you have what you think about that part of the issue, the part of the rest of the um, uh, estheticians, advanced estheticians in the state who we are all trying to represent. I think their feelings count. I don't know them because I don't have Facebook. Are, have you had an idea about what the bulk of, or at least a lot of people are thinking in that field? Um, this is Nap. I am not part of the Facebook group. I mean, I have a personal Facebook page, but I have not. In fact, I kind of tried to Google it while we were talking earlier and could not. I couldn't get on it. I, I don't know much about it. Um, I don't know very much about that Facebook page, so I'm not exactly sure what question. I want to answer your question, and I'm not sure what other question you have. No, I, I think that you're asking about the temperature of like the estheticians and advanced estheticians in regards to Mary. Yeah, I mean, if we go forward okay. today, and we say, mm -hmm. you know, Mary is currently vice chair, and our, our board minutes are going to show that we elected you as chair, and Mary is still vice chair. I just want to mm -hmm. feel like I'm representing the people we're trying to represent, and yet I don't have a lot of input from them because I'm not an esthetician. I'm a physician, so I, I really, I'm a little at a loss there. This is Nap. Um, I think where this is going to get really sticky for us as a, as a board is I'm guessing that there's going to be a camp that thinks that Mary shouldn't be involved at all, and I think there's going to be a camp who just thinks Mary's crazy. This, this is just the kind of the opinions that I've formed over the, the year or two that I've been involved. Um, I think for me, I 100% want to hear from everyone and I, I wouldn't make a decision um, on anything other than, than facts. And I mean, I know it comes down to your gut feel on it eventually, possibly. But I think um, I think we get to a point as a board where we have to stand united 
and we have to look at the job we have to do. I'm not sure that I would want to do this job without Mary, without you. Like even with Gordon being gone, like sometimes we feel that. We need the expertise. Like this board is small. So I feel like um, we either have to transcend and move on because I think Mary has a fan following and a conflict of interest um, I think there's, I think there's definitely two situations going on there, and I feel like we as a board need to make this decision at, at this point in time. I, I, I'm not worried because I think her contribution will be large, but um, I think we need to talk through all elements of what you just brought up. Yeah, this is Davis. I. Um yeah, I'm weighing the, the, the idea of, um, you know, not, I'm not against Mary just retaining vice chair um, at all, um, but just listening to you say, Christy, there is the, there's the Mary plus camp and there's the Mary conflict of interest camp, um, and, you know, I... I asked last time, can I nominate Jan Baquette? Um, and uh, I don't know if how she feels about it. But um, but one thing I will say is she has been somebody who has um, known of these problems that we've had uh, leading up to the present time and has talked about them. And so I don't know if maybe that might be a good way to go, um, just to get a vice chair, somebody you can work with, somebody who knows about a lot of the problems out there that um, general, you know, basic estheticians, you know, estheticians face. Um, and we've got so many issues to resolve. I don't know if Dr. Patel would be willing to serve as vice chair. I have no, I have no idea. So. Nielsen, I think that we have heard Dr. Paquette speak several times this morning saying she doesn't know the issues facing the estheticians in this industry. And secondly, I don't think it is in our best interest to appoint a physician to a board that is regulating or that is working to represent certified advanced estheticians. Okay, this is David. I hear you. Um, you know, she said that uh, because she's not on Facebook, but I know you what she said to the various meetings and even previously you know, on the Rules Advisory Committee in which I serve, that she's very in tune with what's going on. So she may not, I mean, she may have stated, like, I'm not on Facebook, so in, in as far as this dichotomy of this versus that, she may not be intimately aware of that stuff, but she's extremely knowledgeable about the, um, you know, about rules, about laws, about, you know, what happened, uh, the history. And uh, so that would be something that it's not like she's just this fresh flower who knows nothing. <laughs> she's, she's the one who's actually been stating stuff consistently, like she said earlier. She says, I've been t talking about this from the day one. And that's true. That's the Christy thing about here. Right. Oh, go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> No, no, you go ahead. Well, I just want to say I think we have to be careful about I want to uni I want to unify our board and I I'm just a little bit nervous to be completely honest, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't want I don't want to swap out and replace. I think we either need to honor the work that Mary's done and let her let her continue with someone um, chairing 
with her to keep to make sure just to be the voice of every person but I, I'm a little bit hesitant to do like a swap out when um, and Janet are you involved with a school no okay because when I was um, I'm sitting here googling stuff while everybody's talking and I have a website that has I and I don't know who Deborah um, Mapson is, but it shows. So that was that was that issue that the I Academy of Anesthetics. Yes, mm -hmm. they. So I don't. I can't speak for Deborah, but mm -hmm. she came to me when the law passed and there was a period to grandfather in and asked if I would be willing to help with a few classes that she felt a higher level of licensure and understanding may help the students. And just to grandfather in the people who are were already acting as advanced as petitions before we had passed the law that would now redefine them. And so I said, yeah, I can do that. It was only a few classes. I, I was not paid. I didn't charge. I didn't want money. Um, I just right. wanted to try to help out. And so uh, I'm not affiliated with it. I don't even know if it still exists. It, you know, it kind of served its purpose through 2018, so I don't know if she still even has that school. I don't think so, but I don't know. Now, and so I just pulled up, um, it says Academy of Advanced Aesthetics, and it's her picture and your picture. So th these are just little um, super relevant, but I think these are things that we just want to be really, um, I just don't want it to be a flip out, like let's let's move this person and get this other school person in. Yeah. I. I feel like we either trust Mary to contribute and we're going to move forward, or we just need to have a much bigger conversation. Okay. So yeah. again, I did. I wasn't aware of that, and as far as I know, that must be an old picture. I don't know. I don't know how the computer works. Maybe it just stays up forever. But I have no association. I also, I'm not affiliated with any school. I don't have any pluses or minuses to say about any school, and I have not been buying for the position of vice chair. I just want this board to hopefully get healthy and move forward and do the business that needs to be done. So, so that's all I'm going to say now. This is now, and I do feel, I can, I can tell by your tone that you're completely neutral and um, and I agree. I don't think you have a secondary agenda. I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring to your attention that it looks like you own a school. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Or you're the med <laughs> you're the medical director of the school, so you might want to check into that. But that's yeah, all. it's news to me. <laughs> so, so yeah. David, how are you? Um, this is I think. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, David. I think Chrissy, you just pointed out the power of optics. And you know, a couple of pictures hooked together. Uh, what that might suggest, again, in this case, if you believe in good intent, Dr. Paquette, good intent, Mary Nielsen. Um, you know, there are things that are going to happen out there that, from an optics standpoint, don't look good, but people might not fully understand. Um, so, you know, I think every board person here, they bring their own perspective, their own views, they're an asset. All of you in your own unique way. Um, so, in that regard, I think every one of you is qualified by way of you being on the board to be a potential leader. That's all. Thank you. Nielsen. Thank you, Jane. I'm sorry, go ahead. I my term expires at the end of 2021. I believe that I would be a good support and transition person for Christy, but I do also see the other side of the coin. Um, I do want this, the purpose of this board, oh, oh, one other point. I do believe that if I had been acting in an unethical manner, that the board, that they, Health Licensing Office representation of Sylvie and Sammy and Dorinthia and you know Bob who are at our meetings would have um, would have not allowed me to continue. 
because they understand the representation that they have to all of the licensees in the state of Oregon. Secondly, um, oh no, I lost my train of thought, but basically that's the point. I want this board to be able to take action in, in keeping the public safe and in um, ensuring the scope of practice of the advanced esthetician as well as ensuring standard estheticians that we're not trying to take anything away from them. We're not trying to get in there and, and grab their scope or limit what they're able to do, but I do think there is a certain um, percentage of estheticians that do believe that, that people who work on the board are out to get them. They're out to get us. They're out to take away our scope. They're out to hurt us. And I think we need to make our message, we're not trying to hurt you. We're not trying to limit you in any way. We want you to build a fantastic career with what you've got, with the license that you have. You should be able to have a fantastic career and not worry that the board is trying to come down somehow and take things away from you. So, okay, I, that's all. Where are we? Um, w well, I do believe Rebecca made a motion to continue to have you as the vice chair, and then everybody talked, and so that's kind of where you are now. If somebody wants to second that, or and just remember for those, I get that you are all saying how you want to be a unified group. However, you have the right as a board member to not necessarily agree. So just because you're having a vote does not mean you have to say yay. That's the whole point of a vote. So if you don't feel comfortable with something, don't do something just because everybody else is doing it. I get the desire to be a unified group, but that does not, there's a reason there's an odd number uh, board member position. Uh, this is David. So I'm thinking, I'm sorry. David? Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if I go along with the whole, um, if there was nothing to see here, like there's nothing to see here because um, HLO is never stepped in the way. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not their job. You know, that's not their job to call balls and strikes and step in the way of somebody. Um, and I, you know, I, I think listening to this, I think I'd feel more comfortable if we had somebody else on the vice chair. Okay, so am I understanding that there is not a motion, there is no one seconding the motion? Now, Karen. Okay. Uh, I was I was about to second the motion. I just I, I, I feel like we're not done with this topic. So I I guess I I think I feel that Mary will contribute a lot in that support position. And I was about to second it, but I, I actually feel like we're not done with this topic. Uh, David here. Uh, Rebecca. Uh, Mark, please uh, go uh, first and then Rebecca can follow. Mary, it was David Howe. Yeah. It was David Howe that was asking. Oh. oh, I'm having a hard time hearing David and Davis. David Howe, please, please go forward and then let Rebecca speak. Yes, thank you. David Howe here. Um, I think and I do appreciate everybody's heartfelt feelings on this. I mean, you're looking within yourselves and you, you all want to do the right thing. Um, it feels almost as though you're to a point of analysis paralysis. Uh, you can continue to talk about this. 
uh, in all facets. And yes, there's there's value to do that. But you do get to a point where you know you make a decision, you take your vote, maybe you take a revote, whatever, and you you can move on to your next order of business. This is, thank you, this is Rebecca Covey. Thank you, Dave, for all your wisdom. I really appreciate you being on this board. Um, but I did want to bring this back to the fact that I have heard everybody speak about it. And everybody said that, you know, that it was really up to Christy, too, to, to get her feedback on if she would like um, Mary to, to stay in that position of vice and assist her. And I think that we all agree that, you know, it's obviously Christy will be very neutral, you know, chairperson and that she can separate these issues. And so I think it goes back to the matter of, um, you know, the qualifications for the job. And I think Mary has proven that she has worked so very hard over the years, not for her personal gain, but for the, for the, the advancement of this board, advancement of certified advanced estheticians and estheticians. And I feel like if Christy um, has wanted to make a move to second it and Christy would want Mary as her vice, then I think that's what we all basically said to Christy is that it would be, you know, does she feel like this is something that she would like? So I'm hearing that Christy is saying that it is something she'd like to move on. So I agree, I think we need to move along and probably make this, uh, you know, keep this, finish this up. Uh, this is David. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would have probably agreed with that, Rebecca, but you've been sitting there doing opposition research and you're looking on the computer and seeing what holes you can find in uh, Dr. Jan. So I probably would have voted to keep Mary on, but now I, I don't know if I can do that. So, um, um, I'm sorry, I, that wasn't me who did any research on the computer. I have not done any research on the computer with Jan. Now, I don't know. I was the one that asked, uh, Mark, I was the one that asked. Um, I, I, I've just been like, I pulled up the Facebook website. I pulled up the um, the names. It was, that was me that did that. And um, I certainly, I guess one thing that I do as a leader is I'm just trying to bring to light every question that could possibly come up, um, and I and I do think um, I do think we need to make a decision. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding like I'm not a leader that will make a decision. I will, but um, actually, Mark, that was me. And I just wanted I just want to bring everything to light. Whether and this is where I'm I'm really unhappy with the feeling of the camps. I you know I don't I think we need to move forward past that. I. I'm willing to second the motion for Mary to just retain his vice, and you have my word that I want these schools united. Okay. A motion has been made. I will call the roll. Christy Knapp. Yes. Mark Davis. Nay. Janet Paquette. Nay. Rebecca Covey. A. Mary Nielsen. Yes. Okay. This is Sylvie. Are we ready to move on to a little um, lighter conversations? Hopefully. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Our Let's move on. So we are on the agenda under approval of 2021 meeting dates. I do have the 2021 calendar in front of me, so if we need to move things, I can start looking. But we have picked out February 24th, May 19th, September 8th, all starting at 9 a.m. Does those dates conflict with anybody's schedule? Could you, could you repeat them again for me? Sure. Uh, be February 24th, May 19th. Okay. And September 8th. September 8th. Yeah. It'll be 24.
May 19th and they're all this is Sylvie again. They're all Wednesdays. I'm sorry, Sam again. Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine. So um, Wednesday, February twenty first. Wednesday, May nineteenth. And Wednesday, September eighth. Sylvia, I heard it as February twenty first. I thought it was twenty fourth. Twenty four. Twenty four. Two four. Okay, thank you. Yep. Two four. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that works for me. This is Nielsen. All right. Well, and we're um, it hopefully will work for everybody. But if somebody has an issue, now would be the time to speak up if you have an issue with any of those dates. And we can always. And if you don't know now, we could always um, address it at a later date if something comes up. Okay, well, and if nobody has any issues, then somebody other than Mary needs to make a motion to approve the dates. Now, I make a motion to approve those dates. Beckett, second the motion. A motion has been made for the dates of February 24th, May 19th, and September 8th for the 2021 board meeting. I will call the roll. Mary Nielsen, yes. Rebecca Covey? Yes. Janet Paquette? Yes. Mark Davis? Aye. Christy Knapp? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay, so this is Sylvia. Are you ready for the next? Yep. So the next one will be me talking a whole bunch of talk. So um, we're on director's report. A couple of things. We are closed to the public. Our office is closed to the public due to the governor's orders. So we are open by appointment only. And the appointments are for mainly for those who have to take, take an exam in order to qualify for a license. And um, we do make some other appointments. Um, for instance, like study assistance and stuff like that, but it's appointment only, so nobody's allowed just to walk into our doors. And we're also working on getting a new inspector hired. Um, we currently only have three individuals who are doing inspections for all of Oregon, and obviously that is not enough, during, especially during COVID-19. So we're working on getting another person hired up for that. And then we're also internally working on switching from Maria to April. So Maria was the board specialist who would send you all kinds of emails regarding scheduling and materials and all that stuff. And we're working on transitioning that over to April. Um, April has taken over the position and so they're slowly working on changing the duties over. Any questions on any of that? Sylvie, this is Nielsen. Yes. How many appointments a day are there available? Um, so it kind of depends. So we have, if you've physically been here, you've seen our testing room and it has the computers literally like within a foot apart of each other. And normally we could do 18, but with the social distancing, obviously you can't do that. So it depends on that and what other rooms are available. Also what staff are here. And then also depends on how many exams those individuals need to take. So if they're only taking one exam, obviously we could get more people in. But if they're taking four exams, they're going to take up four, four testing slots. So roughly, I would say right, right around 20 to 22 people a day. Again, with all those factors kind of involved. Yeah. And then... Okay. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Same, same thing with the whole cleaning in between each person and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we're working on trying to um, find out, some, doing some different alternative ways of trying to get people te in here to test. Um, we never intended, obviously, or never thought that we would be closed for this long. Um, and then the fact that schools are still um, graduating students, we're, we're, we need to make sure that we're, you know, doing the testing. And right now it's getting pushed out so far that 
is preventing people from getting a license because they can't come in here and test until several months out because we're booked up already. So we're working on some alternatives on hopefully to try and get some more people testing than what we currently are doing. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Actually, my other question had to do with at our um, last live meeting, we talked about um, testing, the new testing for, creating a new test for the advanced aesthetics. Is this the time to bring this up or should I wait till we get to other board business? To your surrender policy? Um, well, it, it's already on your agenda under policy report, so we'll talk about it then. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right, I see it. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions for the director's report before I go moving on to the licensing and fiscal stuff? Okay. So in your materials, you should have the statistics. These, we did not rerun them since, remember, we were going to have a board meeting and we canceled it right at the last minute because Jan's house was in danger for the fires and stuff. So we did not redo the reports. So these are ran as of the beginning of September. So, but that first slide shows the actual number of advanced aesthetic licenses has been B that have been issued. Oh, no, it don't. No, it should, the advanced aesthetics column is blank. So we're going to need to have that, that report redone and we'll send it out to you guys because the provisionals is the one that's gone now. And then that third column over where it says advanced estheticians and it's all blank. You could just flip flop. It's obviously yeah. not pulling information. So hmm. we'll have to have that report redone and sent out. So Sammy, will you? Yep. Um, and actually, you could probably have Nathan do it real quick and then send it out to board members. So we'll get that emailed out to you real quick. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. If you go to the next slide, that one shows the actual trend of, and that one's more accurate, obviously, because it actually has numbers in it. <laughs> but so on average for the quarter is 378 licensees. And so that's where you can see that the other licenses have dropped off. The next slide shows the number of licensees broken out by age and gender. And I think I've said this before, you do not have to declare if you're male or female, which is why there's three. Next slide shows your financials. And so this is, um, was ran on September 1st, so I would assume this is through the end of July. So July 30th is the end of our fiscal year. So, um, or sorry, June 30th is the end of fiscal year. July 1 is the beginning of the new year. So you can see that there that there's nothing in the 2021 column. So this is through June 30th. So this is as of the end of last year. Um, but you're seeing there that your revenues are more, more than your expenses, which is great. Um, in the long term, what we'll do is we'll start um, lowering fees or offering discounts. We need to get you a healthy cash balance. So that if there is a case that gets severe and ends up having to go to a trial or a hearing, um, it doesn't put you automatically in the negative. So we'll work on that. You can see down on the bottom, and you guys have seen this before, it shows the different assessment rates. And we redo that every July 1. So you're going to see there for the new 2021 year, which is actually starts, um, on July 1 of 2020. Your percentages changed. We reevaluate those for the, all the boards and programs that are underneath the office. So you went from 0.439% to 0.466%. And that's based on the amount of licensees that the office as a whole has. And then of all those licenses, how many you guys specifically have. Obviously, you guys do not pay for examinations or inspections. Inspections is done through cosmetology. Um, any licensee in this group obviously has a license in both. So their cosmetology license is the one that goes towards the fee for associated with the inspections. Any questions on the financials? This is Nielsen. Can you tell me what, what your recommendation for what we should have in revenue? Um, 
that you think would be a, a healthier cash balance? I think one of the things that we'll do internally is go back and look at some of the cases that we had as an office prior to you guys becoming um, a board. So for those of you who have been around a while, you know there was a company who did a lots of laser treatments and such that didn't stay here for very long and there was a big lawsuit. So we were highly involved in that. So things like that are what we need to look at. Um, how much that costs, what, you know, how many cases we got, how, how detailed it was. So that's kind of where we'll go to kind of make sure that we have somewhat of a cushion. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yes, I, that helps me understand where you would get that number from. So thank you. Yes. It's previous experience, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Any other questions for the financials before I move on? Okay, let's move on. We're on the regulatory report. Hi, good morning. This is Paul Bothell for the record. So um, we have three bienniums <coughs> on your report, and uh, the 1517 biennium, it shows that there's one case remaining open, and that case is sitting on my desk um, to be reviewed. The uh, 1719 biennium, um, it shows a total of 18 complaints received, three remain open. Two of those three are related to the uh, 1517 case, so those are also on my desk. So we actually have one left open that will reflect in the next, um, by the next board meeting. Hopefully it will be a zero and that will be gone. Um, and then in the current biennium, the numbers are, are incorrect. Uh, we've had a total of two complaints received and two remain open. Any questions? Yeah, David, Hi there, Bob. David. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, David. That, yeah, David, how are you? Yes, David. Um, I think it would be, be helpful to just have, you know, kind of the nature of the kinds of complaints that you're looking at so that the board can see if there's any patterns or trends um, there might be a reflection of, of uh, areas of compliance that maybe need to be addressed by the board. So typically... Is there any way you can provide that? Sure. Um, typically that would be done in executive session, but we don't have executive session today. Um, so some of the complaints that we received, um, actually um, several of them have been um, allegations of unlicensed practitioners performing and then we have a couple where there's uh, injuries but uh, that we can discuss those in executive session um, at the next meeting but that's what we, we hold it for because of the size of uh, the board the number of licensees doing this um, it, we don't put it with the with the daily numbers so nobody, because we don't want to identify anybody, we want to keep our cases de-identified until we're done with them. Make sense? That's understandable. Yes, it does, Bob. Thank you. Somebody else had a question? Uh, yeah, this is Davis, Mark Davis, Bob. Yes. Um, are, are inspectors actually out there in force right now? The inspectors are. Um, the vast majority since um, we've been back out in the field, they have been doing, um, responding to complaints of um, violations with regards to the governor's executive orders as far as uh, practitioners wearing appropriate PPE. Okay. So um, we've had over 200 of those types um, and that, that's that's overall that's cosmetology, body art, um, and um, and you guys obviously fall under the cosmetology. So I couldn't give you an exact breakdown of how many were advanced estheticians. Um, so we've had over 200, and we I uh, talked to one of the inspectors yesterday, and they pretty much have those all wrapped up, with the exception of maybe four. Thank you, Bob. 
This is Sylvie. Does anybody else have a question for Bob? Okay, let's move on. So we are now on policy. So 2021 legislation. So we currently are working on legislative concepts with the legislation um, and our agency. So we do have a policy package that's in place. A policy package means that the office, um, along with the Oregon Health Authority, have requested a package that has been approved by DAS and will go before the legislation to increase the fees for cosmetology. Cosmetology is currently operating in the negative and their fees need to increase. So that policy package is moving forward, hopefully. Um, it's part of agency request budget. Um, it has a whole process to go through, but that'll happen during the legislative session and I'll keep you posted on that. Um, also, if there is any group such as the fair, I can't remember, the, the esthetician group, the fair practicing, fair licensure for estheticians or something to that effect, yeah. um, I know that they have been working on addressing some legislative um, concepts, maybe to change some of the verbiage. They've asked me a few questions. Um, basically, some of their questions are, why is it the reciprocity is not easy and the um, the general for that is that no other state includes tattoo removal as their scope of practice. So no other state is substantially equivalent because the, the, we have, our scope of practice is broader than most other states. So that's one of the big issues. Um, and then another issue that I stated was is that if you have a state that has, say they have two of our seven modalities, you don't have a nice easy pathway for somebody to come in and only do the education for what they need, what they're lacking, in order to be equivalent. So those are a couple of things that um, I suggested and so I don't know how far that's going to go or what those concerns are or how a legislator is going to deal with it. Um, it'll be interesting but those are the conversations. Any questions on that? This is Nielsen. I would like to make a comment about that. Sure. Um, as a licensed school, I know that I have, that HEC has a process which is called the non-credentialed referral process. And they have sent people who are trying to get a license, uh, who are moving from another state, they approach HEC and there is a process through HEC where they can Essentially, as you were talking about, maybe they don't have tattoo removal, but they have hours. It allows their transcripts from another state to be evaluated, and HEC tells them how many hours they and what criteria they need to have in order to get their Oregon license, and then they can approach an Oregon license advanced school and have that happen. So this is still a, so then they're graduating from a life from a, an Oregon school. This is Sylvie. That is correct. So heck, can do that for any type of school. That doesn't mean that heck has the capacity to be able to do it a lot. Um, and so my suggestion was is just making an, an easier, clearer pathway where people didn't have to do that. Because that requires HEC to have all their transcripts, do the evaluation, do a formal, send it on to a school. And I know it's doable, um, but it's also, it would be easier and clearer because for one, it doesn't say that in the statutes or our rules or anything of the sorts. Because you have to understand who HEC is and know who, what they do and contact them. And so, again, I understand exactly where Mary's coming from, but it's also not real clear to everybody out there quote, in another state who wants to come to Oregon on what to do. Then that was my suggestion to just make it a nice, clean, clear way for out-of-staters to be able to come to Oregon and potentially not have to do all the schooling or have to go through a bunch of hoops. Nielsen, I compl uh, Sylvie, I completely agree with you. I, you know, we have been called and I do forward people to hack and tell them to the exact non credential no, I forgot the name of it. Non-credential <laughs> referral process, and it is. It takes. It does take months. It takes a very long time, and it's a very long road for them to go through. But but until we have an option, and that would be my goal, is that I think that needs to be a priority. 
is having that option available for reciprocity and for other pathways to licensure. Um, but at least that's something until something does get in the work. This is Sylvia, that's correct. And so, and I just want to remind every one of you that if there's a legislative concept um, does get brought forward, it will not be from us. Um, us meaning the board, nor the Oregon Health Authority, or the Health Licensing Office. However, that does not mean that you cannot testify. You just need to say, I'm on the Board of Advanced Estheticians, however, I'm in the capacity, I'm here in the capacity of my own profession, or whatever. So, if that legislative concept becomes available, you guys will have every right to go and testify on your personal behalf. And we'll make sure that um, any time a legislative concept becomes available on the legislative website, that you guys are aware of it. So, um, again, those were conversations that I've had with that group. Um, they were wanting to know some of the concerns that the office had, and those were a couple of things that I said it would be nice. because. They had concerns and then they asked me, how would we get this fixed? And that's what the conversations that I had. I could care less if you change the statutes or not. I would just tell you how it would make it easier to fit into the office or it would be easier for reciprocity. So th those are the conversations that I have. <coughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns before we move on to the exam? Okay, so part of the exam where, where our office is kind of, uh, I want to know once these concepts get posted, because if they move forward with a legislative concept that, that changes the scope of practice of aesthetics, it's going to change what needs to be on the exam. So work. I mean, Sorinthi is in the room, and she can give you her her, um, her thoughts on everything. But one of my thoughts was is depending on that legislative concept, if it truly changes the scope of practice of aesthetics, as in taking out the tattoo removal, um, or if they change any of the conversations that we've had before about because it talks about not just lasers but other devices registered with the F the FDA. the FDA. So if they change any of that verbiage, it might change the scope of practice, and that, which is where I'm not really keen on spending a lot of time of rewording a, an exam and knowing that there's a potential of that work not necessarily being accurate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, because there's deadlines. I don't know if Sammy, you can look it up real quick, but there's deadlines on when. Um, leg so, if that group was to move forward with a legislative concept, they have to have a legislator who's willing to put their name on it. And legislators have to drop, well, they call it dropping, they have to drop their um, either House bill or Senate bill, obviously, which determines if they're in the House or the Senate, by a certain date. And once that date has arrived, then we'll know if there's anything moving forward. So that's kind of where, because session starts in February, and so those dates are going to be closer to, I would say, in December-ish. December, December 11th, pre-session filed bills, but it doesn't tell me for like Right, and they still have, so I don't know if you heard Sam or not, um, December 11th is when all pre-filed bills have to be, quote, dropped, but there's also times that things can be added later. And so we'll know a lot more in December. So it's not that I don't want to work on the exam. I'm just not ready to start working on it until we kind of get a little bit closer into the legislative session to know of if there's a whole statute change. Because that if there's a statute change, that means your rules have to be opened back up, have to be all rewritten in order to align. So we'll want to do that before we do the exam or can kind of do them concurrently. But Sorinthi is in the room. Do you want to add anything? Um, no, no, not in regards to not moving forward. That was the discussion that you and I had is, is why put all this work into this examination at this point when um, through legislation it's going to change, so we're Could. just going to hold off. And, Could change. And mm -hmm. one of the things, if you want me to move forward, sure. is um, 
at the February meeting, the board looked at the ABLS examination and requested that I work with ABLS to oh, make modifications. Yeah, you got to refresh them. So this is this seems like about two years ago. So do you guys remember back in February? Um, you, we had Sarithi had talked to you guys about the exam and you gave some recommendations to see if ABLS would be willing to do certain things and then if not do this and do that. Do you guys remember yes. all that? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. That's where Sar yeah. so that's where Sarithi is at now. So yeah. she's going backwards. I was I was going forward in time. She's now going backwards in time. So um, HLO did work with ABLS um, and provided recommendations for modifications to the questions that had been pointed out in executive session at that February 20th board meeting. And um, the result of that was ABLS reduced the number of questions to 136 on the exam from the previous 145. No time. Um, uh, the allotted time had not changed the four hours given to the candidates, and then um, um, accessing the ABLS examination had not changed either. So the, at the request of the board and at the request of HLO based on that board's um, direction, ABLS, ABLS did modify their exam, and I sent notification out, excuse me, I sent notification out to all interested parties on April 14th. Does anybody have any questions for Sorinthia? Uh, so ABLS, uh, this is David, Mark. Um, so they, they basically went ahead with our recommendation, is that right? Yes, you are correct. Because that was a big problem. That was a huge problem. Does anybody else have any questions for Sorinthia? No. Thank you, Sorinthia. Okay, so when when was the exam updated? What date? Remember? As of April 1st of 2020, it went into effect. So we, so Sorinthia worked with them, and then the new modified, cleaned up exam went into effect April 1st. Any other questions? Okay. So let's move on. So COVID-19, I have already talked about it a little bit, but one of the things that we as an office did is... Um, write some rules to address the state of emergency. So a couple of them I'll go over real quick because they'll uh, pertain to some of your licensees. Um, if a licensee was active as of the date of the declared emergency, which was March 8th, um, if you were active as of that date and now have, in, while the emergency was declared, your license became inactive, which means you're late. Um, the late fee was dropped down to a dollar to reactivate during the um, declared emergency, but again, you had to have been active on the date of the declared emergency. Otherwise, your late fee is whatever it is in rule. Um, the other thing is, is we adopted a rule that says that you, as an in licensee, you must be in compliance with any executive orders that the governor has um, enacted, and if you fail to do so, that's unprofessional conduct. So that helps with the um, inspectors who are out doing the inspections and um, addressing individuals who are not um, abiding by the personal services guidelines that came out. Um, another thing is, is that continuing education is allowed to be done remotely during the declared emergency. Obviously because of social distancing and masking and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot, not a lot of um, impersonal much of anything. So we allow for remote um, CEs, they still obviously have to mean, you know, pertain to your um, your f scope of practice. And then there's a few other rules that we adopted that are very specific to some other boards, which don't relate to you guys. But those are basically the rules that the office did for COVID-19 related stuff. Does anybody have any questions on that? All righty. Let's move on. So you do have, we're on item number four, Mary. 
and you do have individuals who yes. are on the phone and so I didn't know if you want to do the individuals on the phone first or you wanted to discuss with the public um, comment that was submitted via I do believe email to Sammy yes. um. Doesn't matter to me. What you have um, pro uh, probably I'm going to take a guess that some of the people who are speaking, who are in the um, audience, probably have things also related. So, um, public. Yeah. So, re Mary, why don't you read your your script, your public interested party Certainly. script, and then I'll get um, just so you guys on the phone know, board members. There's literally physically two phones sitting next to each other. So the board members, you're all on one phone. The public's all on a different phone, and they're right next to each other so you can hear. And so after Mary reads her script, then I'll jump over to the public phone and start asking them and so that you guys will be able to hear. But Mary, go ahead and read your script. At this time, the Board of Certified Advanced Estheticians will hear public, and in public interested party feedback. Members of the audience, please wait until you've been recognized by the chair. Once recognized, please state your name and affiliation to the board for the record. And I think Olivia Nelson. So this. I have no comment. Thanks. Who, who, sorry, this was Sylvie. Who was that? Olivia Nelson, I have no comment. Okay, no comment from Olivia. Is there anybody else on the public phone that would like to make a comment? Uh, this is Deborah Nelson, yes. Good morning, Deborah. Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to make it very clear to the board and to Mary Nelson personally that my complaint with the ethics had nothing to do with any personal vendetta or anything else. I do not even know Mary very well personally at all. But my involvement with the Board of Cosmetology over the past 20 years, I know what is correct and what should be done and what is considered a conflict of interest. And clearly, the report and the video recording or the audio recording showed I and confirmed what happened at the meeting. Mary signed and agreed to the complaint and admitted it. It was not investigated further. So as far as it being a mistake or not true, and I joined this call late, so if I'm making a statement that was already discussed, I'm just saying that what I saw is what I reported, and um, there's no agenda behind it. I believe that leadership should be held accountable to everything. Um, and, when, and after that, we had many concerns about this book. It was brought up during the sessions of um, talking about the exam. Again, we asked Mary directly um, if her book was peer reviewed. It is very important to have credibility and to have truthfulness and to have everything in the open. And again, we were lied to. And so my concerns were brought up because of those things. I have nothing personal. I and wish Mary the best in her business and everything else. I want truth above any kind of ambition or any kind of uh, any other motivation. So, you know, my names get thrown out there a lot, and I am basically saying I do not. I am. That's all that I wanted was truth to come out, and you know, period. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's over. My ethics complaint was done professionally and truthfully, and I. Do not want to hear that I have a vendetta because that is absolutely not the truth, and um, that's it. So you know the truth is out there, and you may do what you want with that as far as leadership or anything else. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Is there anybody else on the public phone who would like to make a comment? Yes, this is Suzanne Laura. Suzanne, sorry, 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 sorry. I uh, it's, I know it's hard when it's on the phone, but I heard Suzanne first. So Suzanne, can you go first, please? Certainly, yes. This is Suzanne Warfield. I'm the executive director of the National Coalition of Estheticians Association, and I just want to thank the board for allowing me to speak today. And I did want to have the opportunity to quickly clarify the NCBA's role over the last several years and the division of aesthetics that is happening in Oregon. In 2007, NCEA launched the National Esthetician Certification, which was an encompassing 
a 1,200-hour program that was based on three geographically designed job task analysis. At no time did laser come out on top as a top task that estheticians wanted to do, which is why the NCEA certified credential is not a, a comparable credential to the advanced esthetician license because it is not about laser. Many other states, Arizona uh, was one, of, as far as we're concerned, one of the leaders. They got together with the medical board and the radiation board to put together a laser. Uh, technician, which basically is, is what we feel that this, this bill currently is. So I just wanted to get that clarification out there as to why the NCEA certified credential cannot be used in your state. Uh, it is being used in Washington and D.C. and on a case-by-case -case basis in Utah and Virginia. However, laser is also coming up as an issue. Um, so as far as that was concerned, um, I did happen to notice in the handout that was provided today that I did not see the letter that NCEA was asked to write and send um, regarding uh, Mary, uh, Mary Nelson's uh, membership in the NCEA. She became a member in 2013, and on April 20, excuse me, April 25th, 2013, she did pass the National Esthetician Certification and became NCEA certified. Uh, her and I had several conversations about the legislative process and how she could get a bill through the organized Oregon legislature. I did spend many hours educating her, introduced her, uh, and asked Judith Culp to also help her, and I believe she was on the advisory committee at the same time. And so I did spend many hours educating her on the process and how NCEA came into writing its own training manual in order to be a reference for the credentialing exam. And that was because when we started working with the subject matter experts and the psychometricians, we could not find answers to our questions in either of the Milady or Pivot Point books at the time. So I cannot confirm Mary's intent, conflict of interest, or predication of creating a book that became a reference for the Oregon State Licensing Exam, I can only relay what transpired within the NCEA Executive Offices. So, um, okay. if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Suzanne. Who was the other person that was trying to talk at the same time she did? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Laura. I am an instructor at the Aesthetics Institute. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, I have been in and out of this phone conversation, so I just, if I'm asking questions that I've already been asked, I apologize. Um, so I am curious about the exam, and I just have a couple questions. Um, we're getting some, a lot of feedback from our students about the study guide and the sources, and not being able to find those answers in the sources that are listed, and I, myself have gone through and had a struggle really to find the answers within the sources that are listed. Um, my secondary question is when I spoke with Steve at the testing center, he let me know that there was an exam committee that was approving these questions. Um, and I guess I wasn't aware of that and was hoping that the schools could maybe get some more clarification on if there's an exam committee or if we can have more input in that way. Um, and then as a follow-up, the books for the curriculum, is that an approval process, those books, is that the Higher Educating Coordinating Commission that approves those books to be used in our curriculum, or is that a health licensing office decision? So, Laura, it sounds to me like you have a lot of questions. So we, this is a public comment period for you to comment on board business. If you have questions about the exam, you're welcome to reach out to Sorinthia Murphy, who is here in our office, and she might be able to help you answer some of those questions. But this is a public comment period, not a Q 
Q and A. Okay, so my I guess what I'm I'm trying to say is that um, the feedback from the students and my personal experience is that the exam questions are poorly sourced um, and very difficult to find those answers. Um, some of the questions that should have been removed based on curriculum changes are still there. That is my comment. And then secondarily, based on that information, the books that have been approved, where did that approval come from? The, right? So that's really important to then be able to address the fact that the questions, a lot of the questions still seem to be um, arbitrary and um, answers seem to be unfindable. So that's all. Okay, no, I'm, we're, all, we're all listening. Um, but Laura, um, when you get time, reach out to Cerinthia and have some of these conversations with her, okay? Okay, I would love to, I absolutely will. Um, when I'm reading through this, um, these emails that are part of this, um, the agenda for this meeting and these back and forth between, it looks like Cerinthia and Deborah, and it, it looks like that question specifically was asked about the approval for the books inside of the curriculum and, and who made that approval. And I don't know, and I don't know if anyone else reading those emails felt that that was answered. Um, and so I guess my comment is I would just really love to know just the, what that process is, um, if it's health licensing or if it's higher educating coordinating commission. And because I feel like that question was already asked in those emails with no answer, um, yeah. I don't know. That's what I was trying to figure out. <laughs> okay. Did, Laura, did you have any more comments that you wanted to make? No, thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else on the public phone that would like to make a comment? Yes, this is Cynthia Mendoza with the Aesthetics Institute. Hi, Cynthia. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I actually did have a conversation with Cynthia not very long ago, and she told me that uh, brand names questions were removed and that um, some of the ways in which there was multiple answers that needed to be elected, um, that that was changed, and that um, things like endermology, which isn't our scope of practice anymore, that that was removed. And we find from our students that that is not actually the case. So the test is, um, the test is really poor. And I was also, um, we were also told by uh, ABLS that us estheticians, we don't need to worry our pretty little heads about, you know, the physics of how lasers work. You know, we don't need to do that. So very condescending that we as females and in the cosmetology field evidently don't need to know anything more than pushing buttons. So I really feel like we haven't made any strides um, at really getting a good test, a credible test, and we don't have credible sourcing. And so I really feel that it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed quickly because you can't have a test that is poor and from not credible sources expect, expect the people to pass it without finding different avenues. So um, I, I really think that this needs to be taken care of ASAP, not let's wait around for it. Okay, Cynthia, I'll, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Did you have any more, anything else you wanted to say? One more comment is that I, I didn't think that um, somebody that has had an ethics violation was able to sit on the boards. And I personally feel that for the committee to come together and feel whole again, that that person should not be on the board. And we're talking specifically Mary Nielsen, if I need to say that. 
Okay, Cynthia, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Oh, and I was at the meeting when Mary brought in her book and sat it down, and it wasn't a book yet, and she says, here's my book, and she says, it's going to be published soon. Nothing was said in any of the meetings, should we accept this book as one of the sources for testing. Okay. So, things have really gone completely and totally wrong in our board. Okay. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's it for the moment. Okay. Thanks, Cynthia. Is anybody else on the public phone and would like to make a comment? No? Okay, we will move on. Okay, so those of you who are on the public phone, you need to put your phone on back on mute, please. Board members, um, I'm assuming that you have read in the materials the letter dated March 2nd, 2020, and then there's emails and such, and I do believe these were things that you have already seen, which I haven't gone through and reread all of them. But this is the emails that were part of the, um, the, God, the ethics complaint. Yeah. But did anybody want to talk about any of this stuff? <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go to item number five, which is other board business. Is there anything that anybody wants to bring up? or anything that you want to make sure that's on the agenda for the February 24th meeting. You guys are awfully quiet. All right, so let's go. Um, Mary, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Well, I'm just kind of reviewing my notes here to see if there's anything that um, we would bring that I think, I mean, I know what's going to, some of the business is going to be on the February meeting, so okay. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I'm no, just going I to. Don't think so. I'll go through. I'll go through everybody's names and give everybody a chance to talk, and I'll come back to you. Um, Rebecca, okay, is there, thank you. Uh huh. Rebecca, is there anything else that you wanted to add, or anything that you wanted to talk about? Uh, yes. So this is Rebecca Kebby, and I was just wondering if we could circle back to some of the items that we were we had talked about starting on the last meeting. Um, I think, you know, I, I hear that some of the school owners, um, you know, are bringing up some different things, and I know we are planning on trying to put a committee together with the different school owners um, or, or one of their employees so that we could, uh, we could kind of address some of these issues. So is that something that's going to be coming back up again um, in maybe the next board meeting? We can. That's you, you guys need to tell us what you want us working on. Um, it's a little hard to have, as you are having a firsthand experience of it, it's a little hard because we can't invite them to physically come here. So you have to do this whole phone thing. So, But we can definitely get a committee together if you would tell us exactly what it is you want um, to know. Other, Obviously, we've heard that the exam is... And Sorinthi was in here taking notes, so she's, she'll work on checking into stuff. But I'm assuming you're wanting Sorinthi to meet with all the schools and talk about the exam and the curriculum and all that kind of stuff, see what's working, what's not working. Is that correct? Well, I think if we could circle back, I know we had quite a discussion on it um, a few board meetings ago, and we talked about putting together, um, you know, a, an inclusive uh, list of all the schools and having somebody represent from each school um, so that we could, we could move through some of these issues and maybe um, come together on them. So I don't know if we could review those notes or have Sammy review those notes for us and kind of bring that back up uh, for the next board meeting to talk about. Absolutely. I think that, for one, everybody in here um, is writing down notes. So I think that between Sammy and Sorinthia, they'll go back and re-review, because you guys haven't met since February, and I think last February was this, about the same as what it is now. So they'll, it'll be, the, I think, the board meeting before that that you guys talked about it. So they'll go back and re-review that and start getting on that. Okay, 
okay, that, that sounds great because I just I think moving forward, trying to um, you know kind of come together and and uh, address some of these things and get back on track will be great. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so Nielsen, I uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think that we have to have people. See, schools should not be struggling to. It is a lengthy process to get an approval from HEC to operate a school. And when you have gone to so much work to create curriculum and lessons and working to get your students qualified, to have to struggle to find an exam to um, that they can pass so that they can then practice this profession, we should be, there, there needs to be a clearer um, answer. And so I think working on that, even though I know we were going, it was going to be tabled uh, because there could be the possible, as you said, scope of practice issue um, and you're waiting for those legislative concepts to come out, I think that just starting to take action on some of the um, uh, some of the testing requirements that we know would not change, we would not be changing things like ANSI standards, laser safety, um, basic laser theory, infection control, Oregon law, there certainly could be some work made towards in that effort so that we aren't um, contracting with a testing company that um, people have lost trust in. Mary, we're all listening and we're all taking, feverishly taking notes. So just because we don't say anything doesn't mean we're not listening to you. <laughs> Yeah, I I agree with that. So let's go down the list. This is Rebecca. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, I'm go sorry. ahead. <laughs> no, I just want to mention from the very beginning of um, you know our discussions with with this uh, scope of practice. You know, we always talked about trying to make sure that we were including people in outer markets, including women that were struggling. And now that you know, as far as being able to go to different places, so I know. That's, that has been something we've talked about in the past and trying to do programs that would that could fit in, whether it's reciprocity, whether it's um, you know, having different sites that they could go to to get their hands on and do some things online. So I definitely think that conversation needs to keep evolving. Um, and I know that apprenticeships were kind of vetoed, but we do need to do something to make sure that everybody in Oregon has access to this training and that we have the best training available and so I'd like to keep that conversation rolling um, as we move through and, and I think talking to all of these schools, having all of their voices heard is going to be a good way to maybe get there. Absolutely. Again, we're, we're not agreeing or disagreeing, we're all taking notes and writing feverishly. <laughs> So we're listening to you. Um, I'm going to go down the list so everybody has a chance to talk. Jan, is there anything that you wanted to say? Uh, no, I think we. I, I'm just listening, and hopefully we're moving forward. That sounds good. All right, perfect. Thanks, Jan. Was, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I wanted to clarify one thing. I, I just mean to not include men. Um, or non-binary. I just know that, you know, in COVID right now, um, you know, we are a very big group of, of women according to our staff, and I know we've been hit pretty hard with um, a lot of these as well as men, so I just wanted to make sure I was not not, not including men in my <laughs> thanks, for, th thanks, Rebecca. We just lost somebody. I'm going to do a quick roll call. Uh, Mary, are you still there? Yes. And Rebecca, you're still there? Oh. Rebecca? I think she got all Twitter pated and hung up on us. <laughs> so we'll just, we'll, we'll just impatiently wait for her to log back on because we can't go any forward.
text her. Rebecca, Sorry about that. it's yeah. all right, Rebecca. That's okay. okay, okay, okay. So let's move on. So Mark Davis, did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Oh, that was easy. Okay, Christy, anything you wanted to add? Yes, um, I I agree with Rebecca. I feel like the health licensing office follows up really well on everything we ask, but I feel like we as a board. We have these great ideas, but we don't always get around to the action side of, you know, like some of these ideas with the schools, because this is such a hot topic right now that if we could, if we could move forward with some action steps, and I'll, I'll be reaching out to people and seeing how we do that in a way that's appropriate and, and very productive, because I feel like we have a lot to offer, and we as a board aren't always following through between times. So that was one thing I wanted to say. And then the other um, question, if now's an appropriate time to ask, is, you know, we have a little bit more access, or it feels like we have access to ask health licensing questions, but I feel like there are a lot of um, estheticians and advanced estheticians out in the field that have questions about how whether operating a certain way is legal or not legal right now, and I was wondering what the best email address would be to give them so that if they have that specific question, they can get it answered. So that's going to be a complex answer. So give me a little bit more detail of like what their questions are. Are they talking about questions regarding the personal services guidelines that came out? Or are they talking about questions about what I can and can't do in my salon, which are the personal services guidelines? So a little bit? Yes, I think... I think they have specific questions where they're making do with social distancing rules or, you know, they, I feel like maybe some of them aren't getting those guidelines. <laughs> I feel like, so I'm wondering what email address would they, like, you know, I think I've been asked 10,000 times, is it legal to wear a shield? Is it legal? So where, where would those generic questions, what email address would we give the public for that? Uh, well, where they're, if they're generic, then it's just the HLO.info one, and then that email then gets okay. either answered by whomever can answer it. The other thing is, is when you go out to our website, so on our, on our website, up towards the top, it, not the very top, because it says Oregon Health Authority, blah, 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 and then there's a grayish, brownish area that says COVID-19. And if you click on that, that automatically takes you over to the COVID-19 related stuff, which includes the personal services guidelines. And right below that personal services guidelines is a Q&A, and it's an extensive Q&A. And it talks about, you know, how often do I have to change my smock? You know, what about this face covering? What about that face covering? So um, all that info is out there. They just, people don't know where to look. That Q&A is like fabulous to answer some of these questions. Um, because those, the Q&A was in response to all the umpteen million same questions that we got in the beginning. Because um, remember, with the personal services talked about some certain things and it was the big picture because it wasn't just cosmetology, it's all personal services. And then we got a thousand questions about how often do I have to change my smock. And so that got on the Q&A because we got tired of answering that question constantly. <laughs> but those two things are out there. People just don't necessarily know where to go to look. And so one of the things is you could familiarize yourself with that and say, look, here's where it already answers your questions. I mean, we have no issues answering those questions too and submitting them the, um, the link to where those things are. But those personal services guidelines came out from the Oregon Health Authority, the Public Health Department, along with the, um, working with the governor's office. And I was involved in that, but those are not this board nor this office's guidelines. Does that make sense? 
Yes, thank you. And I have read the Q&A, and it's amazing. I mean, it yes. really does answer a million questions, so thank you for that. <laughs> yes, that was the whole point of the Q&A, to answer all the umpteen million questions that we kept getting over and over and over. But the other thing, too, is if, the, if they still can't get their information that they need from that, they're always welcome to email that HLO Info one the person who, well, it's not always one person, but the person typically who runs that email knows whom in the office to send specific questions to because it kind of depends on the scenario and what question they're asking. So that's why I don't want to give it to one person and then have to forward it on or that person obviously then changing jobs and that kind of thing. So the HLO info is just always the best bet. This is Rebecca. So the the Q and A is on the health licensing office website. Actually, it's. I mean, if you go to all, the health licensing's website, up on towards the, the, the not quite the top, the top, I would say probably maybe a third of the way down. There's like this grayish brownish that says COVID nineteen, and if you actually put your mouse over it, it turns into a hot link. And you click on it, and that takes you over to the COVID-19 website that talks about all the public services, the masking, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? And is there anything specific? Yes, there's, when I see just some fact guidance, is there anything specific to uh, personal services in there? Right, so you go to, I do believe it, it's the... Um, and I don't have the website up in front of me, but I do believe if you go to um, guidelines and or say, because it, it has like a kind of like the, again those hot links, and once you click on it, then it opens up all the guidelines for all the different types, and the personal services is in there, because there's also guidelines for hotels, there's guidelines for restaurants, there's guidelines for the Oregon Lottery and the bars, you know. So mind you, we're all in there somewhere. But if you get to the personal services guideline, right below that is the Q&A that's related to personal services. And the other thing too is I can just have Sammy email you the link that gets you right to it and then you could save that in your like the Outlook or web browser, whatever it is you use. But then you could also forward that on to other individuals who are asking questions instead of trying to dig for it. So. Sammy will send, email that out to everybody via blind copy. Thank you so much. I am on the page, and for some reason I can't find it, so I it's on our blog. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's just so much information out there, and it's <clears throat> you know, it's yeah. Sammy will just email it out, then you guys save it, and then you can forward it on to whomever you want. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Oh, of course. All right, does anybody else have anything that they want to talk about before we wrap up the meeting? Okay, so um, don't hang up after, but if Mary, you would le read your closing script and we can finalize the meeting, but then don't hang up. Okay. The Board of Certified Advanced Esthetician meeting is adjourned at 11.30 a.m.